Okay, so the topic of my talk is the use of observations in uncertainty quantification. A lot of textbooks that cover uncertainty quantification have a very short section on um, how uh, uh, to compare uh, a model against data. And usually it's uh, using a Gaussian assum uh, assumption and using kind of a, 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 a addition of sum of squares that are normalized by the local variance. Now that's, um, <clears throat> uh, maybe that's all that needs to be said on this subject. Uh, but when you think about what the uh, observations are providing is a way to test the physics of a model. And as you, you may be aware that observ observations of climate are quite complex, uh, ranging from uh, hourly time scales, uh, you know, with uh, storm development and uh, to monthly time scales where you see kind of uh, average precipitation events. Uh, to interannual variability, it has length and time scales on many different uh, uh, scales, and it's uh, not trivial to know how best to compare your uh, model against observations. It's also not trivial to know how to synthesize different kinds of observations. And also, what I'll be talking about today is uh, I guess these are the, the topics. Um, the the fact that there is a big distance between a model and data. Uh, we refer to this as kind of an irreducible error, that no matter what we're trying to do, that there's some amount of distance that, uh, uh, that, uh, that our models are not uh, able to, to, uh, to see through. So uh, what does uncertainty quantification mean in this context where you have this big bias between your model and your data? And finally, there is, uh, a topic called emergent constraints, which is what is it that we need to observe uh, that is important to get right uh, so that we have confidence in future climate predictions or projections. So kind of in summary of the, some of the main points of this uh, lecture is that uh, one, data is used in a probabilistic framework to select the different versions of the model that are valid uh, for, for predictions. However, not all data is useful to predictions. So ultimately, it's important to understand how the data is being used in order to use, uh, you know, to, in order to select uh, the data uh, and to create uh, uh, to test the model, different, the different model versions, to know that it represents uh, data constraints on uh, process, processes, outcomes uh, that are of, of interest. So, so that's kind of a summary of, of the use of data. And I'm going to start with a topic that, I'm, uh, that I like a lot, which is uh, paleo data uh, and paleo climate. So paleo refers to uh, you know, the past before there was rec uh, recorded history. In fact, the climate records here are proxies. We don't have thermometers and instrumental data to test our knowledge of past climate change. Instead, we have the evidence that's left behind in the fossil record. Ice cores, sediment cores in the bottom of the ocean, uh, cave deposits, tree rings, uh, pollen, the bottom of lakes, uh, lake sediments. There's, there's kind of an endless list of possibilities for uh, the evidence that currently exists in the fossil record for knowing how climate has changed in the past. And why would we do this? Well, uh, uh, from an uncertainty quantification uh, perspective, it's, it's useful because past climate, often we know uh, the main forcings of, uh, so either variations in carbon dioxide concentrations, which we have uh, from ice cores, or um, uh, Earth's orbital geometry, we know uh, those uh, variations back through time. And so if you know uh, the forcing and you see the response, that is uh, the beginning of a controlled experiment. Unlike uh, we have today with uh, present climate where we see a, a variation on something and there's all kinds of speculation uh, concerning uh, what was the cause, whether it was internal variability or not. So one of the advantages of paleoclimate is that there is often a big uh, 
forcing and, and, and the, the response is fairly obvious in the, in the geologic uh, record. The other thing is that uh, if we're thinking of testing models with data uh, and we're thinking of using modern data, we have to be a little bit uh, careful about this notion that we're using the same data to develop the model as we are in testing it. So uh, paleo data provides a, a way of uh, kind of, it's called the out of sample uh, test where uh, we may develop, use modern data to refine the physics of uh, convection and, and the like, but we may use the observations of climate at last glacial maximum to know whether the uh, that physics that we inserted that explains modern climate can also explain the changes that occurred uh, last time uh, there was ice ice sheets covering all of North America. So the other thing is that climate paleoclimate data is wild. There's all kinds of variability that is evident in these records that is uh, unlike many of the, the changes that we have observed uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, in fact, over much of recorded history, uh, we don't necessarily see the amplitude and scale of the events that have occurred in, in the past. So in the, in the 2013 report, there was a section on paleoclimate looking at uh, basically coming to the result that a lot of the changes that we uh, uh, know about in uh, last glacial maximum and the warm periods uh, three million years ago and 55 million uh, years ago are uh, on large scale reproducible by climate models. So the, in this uh, figure, the top, uh, uh, let's see, panel A and panel D refer to future climate projections from uh, the IPCC models in the CMIP-5 archive showing that uh, at 2080 to 2100 under the RCP 8.5 scenario, we expect sea surface temperatures to warm about two and a half degrees, land temperatures to warm by uh, about five degrees uh, Celsius. Of course, we don't have observations for that. Uh, and we'd like to know, is that a reasonable uh, projection? Well, let's go to a time in the past when CO2 was about 200 parts uh, per million. There was large ice sheets covering. Orbital uh, geometry was about the same as today. And so between the ice sheets, and uh, which has, uh, uh, reflects a lot of sunlight, and the lowered CO2 values, the climate was a lot cooler. And what we have here is the uh, modeled changes uh, with a lot of dots, and those dots have estimates of the change in um, you know, proxy records for that time. And if you, and there's the land, and then there's the ocean, and if you can't see the dots, that's good, because that means the uh, model is very consistent with the observational record. And for the most part, uh, in, even considering the warm climates, uh, models are consistent. So that, is, let's say, one of the uses of paleo data is that models do okay. So we should have some confidence in these models that, that uh, uh, the response to carbon dioxide is reasonable. Okay, so now we'll go to some of the wild side of uh, past changes in uh, climate. So the top panel is uh, the uh, variations in uh, oxygen isotopes, which is a proxy for annual mean air temperature. Uh, showing, so the present uh, is here on the left, going back, in this case, about 100,000 years. Uh, the last 10,000 years uh, was relatively stable, warm climate. And then as we go back to, into the last ice age, we see these abrupt shifts in climate. And uh, that, the, the Greenland ice cores revolutionized our understanding of how, cli how fast climate can change. Because originally we thought these ice ages kind of uh, wax and wane very slowly. And then once we got a hold of these ice cores, we saw that in fact the ice age here ended fairly much abruptly, within a few years. It went from basically a glacial climate and Greenland being uh, about uh, 20 degrees cooler 
uh, then present to something about 16 degrees warmer almost uh, overnight. In fact, it was about uh, three years that uh, we can tell that, that that transition occurred. And we see this abrupt shifts in climate occurred fairly regularly during the last ice age. And so on, on a kind of a millennial time scale. And we suspect that, uh, that these abrupt uh, transitions have something to do with the overturning circulation in the ocean, but it's not definitive. We haven't really nailed down uh, cause and effect, whether these abrupt changes were kind of an internal mechanism to the climate system or if they were forced externally in, in some way. Uh, there's, uh, the changes that happen at high latitudes were also linked to major hydrologic changes in the tropics. So here, uh, cave, Chinese cave deposits and the Borneo cave uh, deposits uh, are interpreted to reflect kind of moisture abundance. And uh, so in this figure, they lined up basically these uh, Heinrich events, uh, which are in blue, and these major drying events in, in the tropics. Uh, it's not so clear whether every transition, abrupt transition, is also accompanied by a major hydrologic event in, in the tropics. But certainly, there's enough evidence su to suggest that uh, these changes uh, were not just confined, let's say, to the polar regions, but they were global in scale. And uh, we don't uh, quite have a great explanation uh, for these events. So uh, what does that mean for uncertainty quantification? Well, we'd like to know about risks, uh, whether our models are adequate uh, tools for uh, uh, extrapolating out into future climate. If our models can't necessarily explain these abrupt uh, transitions of climate, then uh, you know, there's always a little bit of an asterisk uh, to our, uh, our, our projections that uh, while we may have confidence in, let's say, the physics governing uh, the processes that we've taken into account, there are still things that uh, we may yet be unaware. Or maybe the, uh, this, like these transitions involve, like say, the coupling between the uh, ice sheets and the ocean and the atmosphere, which at present is only just uh, coming online uh, within a couple of climate models. So there may be some modes of variability that our models are unable to, to capture. So we, have conf we, we should be uh, happy that uh, climate models are adequate for explaining the broad features of past climates. Uh, Questions remain about the nature of abrupt transitions. Uh, and I guess I didn't talk about this, but um, so during the past 10,000 years, there also appears to be a mode of uh, millennial scale variability. Uh, that's, uh, if you think of the Little Ice Age, the medium of a warm period, these are manifestations of this mode of uh, millennial scale variability. And it's hard to account for the amplitude of these changes using only solar forcing uh, and volcanoes. So, um, so just, uh, I guess that's, I, I don't want to uh, go too far into that one at present. Okay. So, how do observations fit into a Bayesian probabilistic framework? Well, uh, let's say we're starting, let's say the easiest way, easiest thing to do is assume that uh, the errors that exist between a model uh, and data are multivariate normal. And uh, the place where we can uh, 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 quantify the distance between model, model and data is in something called a likelihood. So we've been talking about uh, Bayes inference uh, where we want to know uh, the parameter settings for a model given the data D and that would be proportional to some function that says the likelihood of data given the model uh, times the prior probability for the parameters. So this, this likelihood function uh, here in matrix notation, which I will explain uh, further in a moment, has this uh, basically your model, which here is the, the, the G is our operator, which are, is our climate model, up uh, with inputs of the model settings, M, and we're taking a difference at every grid point with observations. And uh, here is C inverse, which is our data covariance matrix inverted. So the inverse data covariance matrix. And that is normalizing the 
Uh, so really what's happening is the sum of squared differences normalized by variance. And this is a likelihood test statistic. So let's talk about this formula, uh, this multivariate normal, uh, from a perspective of a single observation. So we have our data, and uh, this is our model X. And X1 is, uh, uh, is calculated from a climate model using input parameters M. And there might be some aspect of disagreement between the model and data, and uh, we're giving that uh, uh, that to, to kind of make up the remaining distance through an error term, epsilon. And uh, for purposes of a multivariate normal, uh, here we assume that the mean of epsilon is zero with a variance of uh, um, uh, sigma squared. So the probability of the data given the model with this kind of uh, assumptions about the, uh, the distribution of the errors is a Gaussian distribution where we have uh, just the, uh, the distance squared uh, divided by the local variance. So that's like a signal between your data and your model divided by uh, the, the variance. So it's a signal to noise. And uh, what we want, we accept parameters that were within basically the noise of data. And the noise, what's included in the noise? Well, it's whatever uh, accounts for the distance between uh, the, the data and the, and the model. And we are assuming that that has a zero mean, which is not usually correct. But for, for right now, we are going to assume it, that it's correct. So how do we combine two or more observations? So if we had two observations uh, that are correlated, the way of representing that within a multivariate normal distribution is to have the two terms assuming that they're independent, which is uh, each data point uh, minus the model squared over a normalizing variance. And then we have the term minus two rho and then the covariance uh, between uh, the x point, uh, the, the first data point and the second data point. And notice that that minus sign means if those two variables are correlated, positively correlated, that would reduce the value uh, that's, in the, that's being operated within the exponent. So the larger the exponent, the, 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 the larger the e to the bigger the number, uh, minus the big number, means that that overall likelihood goes uh, smaller. So uh, if there's a big gap between data, the likelihood says uh, that, that uh, uh, there's less probability of having or accepting that, uh, that model. So when data is correlated, that means the significance of the gap between the model and data is uh, less. So it's, uh, when you, you, when you play a game, uh, let's see, uh, I guess, when reporters go out into the world and I uh, wanted to know whether um, an event, uh, uh, what people's perceptions of that event, if they only hear it from one person, they say, oh, okay, that's, that's what that person's perspective is, uh, that, that's good. And then if they hear it from a second person, they say, oh, okay, so two people think that, uh, I now I'm gaining confidence that that event really happened. Uh, and the more people uh, relate the same story, the, the more confidence you have that that story is probably correct. But what if uh, all the people that you heard from originally heard it from the same person? So ultimately, the significance of the, uh, of, or the confidence you might ascribe to all that uh, information is less because all that information is really dependent on that one source. So, um, so that's really what's being kept track of in the likelihood function with the uh, data covariance matrix. Uh, we have to provide the data covariance matrix how all our data is uh, dependent on it itself so that when there is this distance between the model and data, uh, we know how to ascribe uh, how confident we should be when rejecting a, a model. So that's why it's a test uh, statistic. So going back to our expression here, uh, this was kind of a cumbersome wave with just two data points. It has these three terms, uh, and that's messy. 
So if we want to generalize that uh, using matrix notation, we have a vector x and a vector d. Uh, and C is a square matrix or the covariance matrix inverted. Uh, and so this is what it is for two points. And this is easily extendable uh, with uh, this uh, to n points, n, uh, uh, the addition of uh, or combination of n points. So there are a lot of these terms in the likelihood function. And uh, so that's uh, the chide, which is very nearly the same as uh, what is a chide squared distribution. That is, the chide squared distribution is a sum of squared differences of, uh, in this case, k random variables. Uh, that uh, all have the same variance sigma squared. So if you take the sum of k random variables that are squared, normally distributed, sorry, I left that out, normally distributed, uh, the expectation of that chide squared sum is k, or the, the, val the number of um, uh, independent variables that you're uh, adding up. The variance in the chi squared distribution is 2k. So if you're ever wanting to estimate the degrees of freedom of a system, you can calculate uh, basically the, uh, your cost function and look at the, uh, the scaling between the mean value and the variance of that cost function to infer uh, the degrees of freedom. It's not a terribly accurate, uh, let's say, it's not a terribly precise uh, calculation. There's a lot of uh, uh, variation in that value, although it is uh, um, accurate, an accurate estimate, assuming that your data is, is normally distributed. So uh, we sometimes don't know what the K is but we can use our data uh, or use some strategy to figure out what the degrees of freedom are. Um, so in the example that I think is useful for instruction, it's like the, the easiest model that you can think of, which is uh, a, the, the equation of a line and the slope and intercept that you would need to go through a set of uh, data points. And the more, as you know, the more, or maybe you maybe you would guess, is that the more data points that you have, uh, the more confident you would be in your estimate of the slope and intercept. So we can use Bayesian inference for parameters of the slope and intercept. And this is an example where uh, you do that, uh, and the slope and intercept are, uh, there's the true answer in red uh, with uh, the estimate uh, in green, I believe, and uh, those aren't perfectly lined up uh, because, uh, you know, the, da the data has noise in it. Okay, so in summary, climate data affect a, uh, our uncertainties through the likelihood uh, function, which is a test statistic. So a st test statistic involves uh, degrees of freedom, which is basically the, uh, a sum of the independent bits of information that you have, and you have to provide that uh, uh, correlations within the test st statistic through this covariance matrix, all this assuming that your errors are multivariate normal. And uh, we often assume uh, climate data is multivariate normal, even if it's not precisely true because the multivariate normal is such a convenient way of, uh, of uh, calculating uh, things. And if uh, our data, let's say precipitation is not, uh, doesn't have a normal distribution, we often we transform it uh, using, let's say, a, a, a log transform to bring it approximately back into some normal distribution so that we can use it within this uh, test, uh, uh, this multivariate normal uh, assumption. So there, so we can represent dependencies within our covariance matrix, but that's not the same as saying we know what the dependencies are in, among climate data. 
And we often use a model to estimate these covariances, but a model itself uh, is what we're trying to test. So it's probably not the best idea to use uh, a, a model's estimate of covariance within a test uh, statistic. Uh, but having obser an observational basis for that is still kind of a, a, a challenge. We still need to work out uh, that, that problem. So, so now I'll talk about irreducible error. And, and that is, refers to a gap that exists between a model and data, uh, though that no amount of tuning or fit, uh, uh, kind of this, with the knobs, the different parameters, you can, you can vary those. No amount of kind of uh, altering the model in the kind of the, the easy way will reduce that uh, distance. So that's uh, Jim McWilliams uh, wrote a paper uh, that uh, makes that, uh, uses that term, it's irreducible error. So uh, that's a, a climate scientist saying irreducible error. Uh, but in, in statistics, they sometimes refer to this as structural error or model discrepancy. So if there is this discrepancy, we know that when you're trying to fit a model to data in the presence of a discrepancy, that it has, uh, that you can basically adjust the parameters to better match your data for the for the wrong reasons. And uh, so that would throw off model calibration, which is the model calibration refers to the uh, uh, using Bayesian inference uh, to infer those parameters. And they uh, often, well, well, it implies an uncertainty distribution about those, those parameters. So, it, so the ability to do model calibration is thrown off by these irreducible errors, which we know exist. So it, it turns out uh, through many different uh, effort to, to uh, do model calibration with uh, the Hadley Center model, with the NCAR model, uh, one funny result is that the total amount of re error reduction that has occurred through fiddling with the parameters only amounted to about a 10% a improvement in, in the model performance. And here is this uh, uh, metric of the distance between the model and data, uh, all normalized by the distance that existed for the default model, which is given by one. And so the, the, uh, they were able to, uh, this is the Hadley Center. Uh, this is a paper uh, by Stainforth and co-authors in Nature, where they did this uh, climateprediction.net, uh, where they, uh, uh, Everyone can run a, the Hadley Center climate model on their personal computer. All these different computers ran uh, their own version with their own uh, parameter settings. And in the end, they were able to find a number of settings that approximated observations with, here's, a, here's a, this cost mention, almost uh, better than necessarily the multi-model uh, multi uh, ensemble. And you can say they, they found a bunch of models that uh, had e about equal or better performance than their default model but yet had, in this case, looking at global mean temperature after doubling CO2, which is referred to as climate sensitivity, uh, between 2 and 12 degrees Celsius uh, warming. Uh, we said, well, that's a huge range. And so later uh, they said, well, these models actually had an unreasonable amplitude of the seasonal cycle. And so if we use additional data in their uh, likelihood uh, function, they could have eliminated uh, some of these model configurations. But really what I'm, I'm saying right now is that uh, when they searched through parameter space, they only found models that were better than the default by about 10%. And uh, so there's this big gap. What to do about it? What, what effects does it have? One concern that uh, we also have about irreducible errors is that they exist between different reanalysis products. And this was a surprise to me in that when I did the Bayesian uh, calibration of the, uh, the, the community atmosphere model, I first started with the NCEP uh, reanalysis data as my target. Uh, and I got one set of pr uh, parameters that did not agree with what uh, NCAR thought were uh, reasonable. 
And I later learned that they weren't using the NCEP data. In fact, they were using the, uh, the ERA 40 reanalysis product. And when I uh, swapped in uh, that data product, uh, I was able to find uh, parameter settings that were in approximate, were at least consistent with the choices that uh, they had made. So that's, a, uh, let's say, a curiosity. So one of the things I did to investigate this further was to measure the distance between the model and each of these data products and the distance between the data products. And you could basically form uh, a triangle. Uh, the, you know, the, the units are in units of, of cost, so that's, they're all normalized. You can do it among all the different variables. And you can see that, uh, on average, that the, the community atmosphere model was closer to the uh, ERA 40 reanalysis product and that there was, a, there was a pretty sizable gap between the NCEP data and the ERA 40. And one of the uh, things that reanalysis products are not guaranteed to get similar are quantities such as uh, shortwave radiation downwelling at the surface uh, because that quantity involves clouds, and in these reanalysis products, they're not they're not trying to predict, they're not trying to make you make use of observed cl cloud quantities. Actually, I think that's been evolving. Some places are now starting to uh, assimilate cloud observations, but back then uh, uh, they weren't. And so the the distance between the model and each of the reanalysis products was equal. So so. It means that the reanalysis model that's used to uh, uh, interpolate in space and time the observations to give you a nice gridded product, that involves a model. And the model that was used by NCEP is different than the one by ECMWF. And uh, so, the, so that, uh, the, the, and that's because of their parameterized uh, representation of clouds and uh, which is different between those two models. So now you can maybe get an idea of where this irreducible error comes from in that uh, we can't necessarily trust that our models don't have their own uh, biases that uh, can accumulate in the system. So if it's not getting the right amount of radiation uh, heating uh, the surface, hitting the surface and heating it up, then you can say that those errors will also propagate to other quantities and, uh, and therefore, there is this, um, this, this gap. Uh, so let me take a look at uh, this figure, which is the difference between NCEP and ERA-40 uh, for shortwave radiation reaching the surface in uh, June, July, June, oh, June and July. Um, and the top panel is the NCEP reanalysis data. The middle panel is the ERA-40. And you can already see uh, quite a bit of difference between them. And in fact, when you do take the difference, uh, it gets up into this red, which is between 80 and 100 watts. And the deep red up here, particularly near the poles, is above uh, 100 watts per meter squared difference. Another difference between these two products is uh, the relative humidity, which is, goes between 0 and 100 percent. And the difference in between those two estimates of relative humidity uh, reach upwards of, oh, I guess the scale uh, is nonlinear. Uh, let's see, it goes from uh, 0, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, and 80 percent. So there's above 20 percent difference in the polar regions. Uh, and uh, the opposite of that in mid-latitudes. So, so in Bayesian calibration, uh, there is a strategy to, uh, to deal with this irreducible error or the, the, uh, the, the discrepancy. So if you recall that we had this error term in there before, and that had a, a, a mean of zero between our model and data. So now we add another uh, error term, and which is referred to as the discrepancy term. And here, uh, uh, we can also assume a multi multivariate normal distribution, but uh, has a different mean, which may be a function of, uh, of, of our, our space. 
So in this, should, there should be a squared here on the sigma, so that's a variance. And using a multivariate normal to describe functional uh, changes in how a function behaves in, in, uh, in space is called, referred to as a Gaussian process model. And Dave Higdon uh, will, uh, uh, gave a talk on, on, gave, uh, on Gaussian process uh, models. So in this case, uh, the discrepancy term uh, enters into the likelihood function in the numerator, and, uh, and this allows for the data to be matching, say the model to be matching the data where it can, not trying to fit where it can't. And this is kind of the tricky part of Gaussian process model, um, uh, modeling of the discrepancy, is that it's often hard to know uh, what, is, what, is, what is it that we want the model to do versus what do we think it can't do. Uh, and if we're thinking about it as a, as a bias for, for climate predictions, we have to think about, well, what accounts for the bias? What can we expect for the model to do at present? And how will that change in the future? So, that, and that seems pretty hard. And, and actually, there's, there's a result here that I will uh, share with you shortly that basically says this is a very, very hard uh, thing uh, to do. Uh, a second option is, uh, let's say, a, a bit more standard practice. It's a bit easier uh, to do. Uh, but there's a kind of a different interpretation. So uh, another way of accounting for bias is to expand the variance that uh, exists to normalize what, it, what, what is the significance between a model and data. So we have in our likelihood function, we have the distance between the model and data. And we square that and we divide it by some variance. Well, let's, uh, let's scale this variance by some additional amount when there is this irreducible error. So S is that quantity, and you know we uh, we pull S from a gamma distribution with uh, uh, parameters alpha and beta, with an additional factor here, uh, where uh, beta plus the uh, E of M, which is our likelihood value, our log likelihood value. The See, what is it? Gamma. Gamma distribution is, uh, comes from, uh, it's a generalization of the normal distribution. Uh, and that uh, if, uh, and it's kind of like, it looks like a skewed normal distribution where the mean is alpha over uh, the, the, the first part divided by the, the second part of, of the ar argument for the gamma distribution. So, uh, it may not be obvious why we chose the gamma function here and uh, why we stuck the cost function in here. But uh, if, you, if you will, if we have the cost function in the second term, if we have a large model data discrepancy, that will make the mean value of S go lower, which is the same as making the sigma bigger. So S here uh, is a function of the model parameters. So it's referred to as a hyperparameter because of that uh, dependency. And one needs hierarchical Bayes to solve for both uh, the model parameters M and S when doing uh, calibration. And uh, so I wanted to explain a little bit about hierarchical Bayes and how we use it here to estimate for um, uh, parameters, both uh, uh, parameters M and this hyperparameter S. So we, we, the problem that we want to solve is the estimates of parameters M and S given the data, and we have a likelihood function of the observations given the parameters and S and prior probability for the parameters M and the hyperparameter S. So from this last expression, because we expressed each M and S as separate probabilities, we're inferring that they were independent uh, as from a, coming from the, the prior. It's so really only through the likelihood do they adopt their kind of dependency. So from this, uh, we have 
we can, we can uh, kind of create two, two true statements. One is uh, that the uh, probability for M given S and the data is equal to uh, our likelihood where we incorporate S times our cost function and another uh, uh, probability for S given our model M and the observations. And so you could go, walk through kind of a, a, a Gibbs sampler type of strategy to iteratively uh, create samples for M and S that are codependent. And in order to do this uh, is to first, um, so we simulate our climate with M uh, and assuming uh, not yet an S, but we, 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 we calculate uh, our climate with a given M and then we simulate uh, or pick uh, an S conditional M using our, our cost function uh, by picking it from uh, this gamma distribution with uh, the two parameters that uh, alpha and beta plus E of M. Uh, in this formula there is this thing about degrees of freedom here. So we do need our estimate of the degrees of freedom in order for this uh, thing to work properly. Uh, but that's kind of how you do it. You, you first uh, do it without S, uh, you, you pick an M, run the climate model, you compare it with uh, observations, calculate a cost, then you pick an S value uh, that uses that uh, cost value uh, and then that S value is paired with those M values and you keep on doing this uh, one after another and that means that when you're, you create a joint, when you look at the end of all the uh, estimates of M and S, you have a joint probability uh, distribution. So maybe this was a side note on here on how to make use of observations, but I'm um, trying to uh, also convey a bit more of um, the probabilistic framework one can use to make use of observations and data. And I would say this term is critical for this, uh, the ability to account for this discrepancy between the models and data and how we can make use of the observational re record to test, uh, test models, particularly when we have uh, this uh, discrepancy. So there's a really useful paper uh, by uh, Ginny uh, Brinjar's daughter and O'Hagan written in uh, 2014. My apologies uh, to Ginny uh, for the pronunciation of her last name. And this was a really well written paper that explains, uh, kind of summarizes a lot of the literature on uh, what is this discrepancy term and uh, uh, why we should be using it and, and what are the challenges. So in this, uh, they use a model uh, that was very, very simple, right? It's uh, a model for the amount of work that comes out given a certain amount of effort. And the model is uh, that is basically uh, that work is directly proportional to effort. But in, in observations, uh, Gini uh, allowed allow there to be a bit of uh, in inefficiency uh, involved here in that when you put in more, much more effort that uh, some additional uh, um, inefficiency existed and so the amount of work that is seen is slightly less than the, basically the uh, than the, the one where it was um, just proportional, the work was proportional to effort. So here are predictions for, uh, oh, for an extrapolation of the amount of work uh, that would be result if with an effort of six. And so that's a, so we know we have data up to uh, effort four and if we don't use the model discrepancy, the Bayesian calibration for the parameter uh, theta is off. So predicting, oh, say predicting something around uh, close to 3.5, uh, which is up, up here, where in fact the, the true answer is uh, three. So that's without using this model discrepancy term uh, using this Gaussian process modeling 
we, we, we can in basically uh, enlarge the solution space uh, to include what, to include the real answer, which is useful. And uh, there is a way of doing this uh, um, with constraints on the Gaussian price process uh, such that you're only looking for a certain type of solution. So first let me illustrate what is a Gaussian process doing in this case. So these, all these squiggles are uh, a possible uh, way that the, the, the discrepancy could exist between the model and the data uh, with effort going from zero to four. And, uh, and you notice that these are all kind of uh, wavy uh, uh, terms and uh, the uh, you have full control over these things, and in fact, you can uh, only you, you may want to choose ones that are only gradually varying. And, in, and in, uh, one possible choice here is to say that over uh, over several intervals of effort, that you'd only expect uh, efficiency to decrease with with effort. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in the the, uh, here is uh, the estimates of the discrepancy term with the, uh, as you know, there's data between zero and four, and they're able to basically model or use this Gaussian process to estimate this discrepancy term pretty well over the period where we have data. But for between four and six, or in this case, four and eight, the discrepancy term just didn't know, there was no constraint uh, on it, and therefore the, there was huge variations in what uh, the Bayesian calibration was doing to estimate it. And, it. and it got down to a pretty fundamental challenge about this uh, problem. And it says, in order to ob obtain a realistic extrapolation, we need a realistic prior information about the discrepancy, both in the range of the data and outside and out to the control var variables values that we wish to predict, which means that um, the, we need to know a lot about the discrepancy even where we don't have data in order for this, this thing to, to work. Okay, so I want to go through the results of a calibration exercise I did with the community atmosphere model where we incorporated um, our S strategy for accounting for model uh, discrepancy. And, that, where, and this is the case where we use S as, uh, to expand the variance, covariance uh, terms uh, in order to become more accepting of alternate model uh, configurations when there is this irreducible error. And what we find in this exercise is that CAM cannot get all these different variables simultaneously. And that's probably because the physics in CAM is not the same as what's either in the reanalysis data that we're, we're predicting and or the, the observations that, that we have. It turns out that the region that the calibration selected was kind of in the, in the middling uh, section of parameter space where uh, there were these kind of competitions between uh, these observations and where basically it said, uh, oh, I'm not going to favor any one. I'm going to uh, be in the middle and not develop a large error with any one uh, product. So the, when doing the, the uh, samples of the, of the posterior for, in this case, six of the 15 parameters that we fiddled with, uh, these are samples from the posterior, and these samples uh, were able to find or uh, be at a peak near where the default value was uh, that was selected. And this is, uh, let's say, a success in the ability to manage discrepancy to have a successful calibration. So. Just because the, the math and you know, the machinery for generating uh, this, uh, this calculation uh, was, you know, was a big effort, just because there was so much going into it doesn't mean that the calculation uh, would have been successful. We actually have a lot of questions about whether it's, it's a sensible thing to do to search through parameter space and only pick those models that are consistent with, with data. 
uh, because it could be that we're, comp we're uh, the, the irreducible distance between model and data is going to create opportunities for compensating errors. Uh, we don't know whether the default setting itself is already uh, accommodating these, these, um, uh, these errors in its own way. So, ah, okay, so, so I'm, I'm going to illustrate this last point that the uh, parameters that were selected for CAM were doing okay, uh, but, but not necessarily trying to match particular observations all that well. So what we're seeing here is a grid of um, experiments with varying two of the model parameters, KE and C0. KE is the entrainment, a, a parameter that regulates entrain, cloud uh, air entrainment, and C0 is about the uh, collection efficiency of hydrometers in, in uh, uh, raining uh, clouds. So uh, the colors refer to the log likelihood or the distance between the model and observations, where blue is the, you know, the uh, configurations that have a small uh, distance. And most of the model selection was right here in this part of parameter space. And the contours give you an estimate of the density of the number of samples. And the number of samples is proportional to the posterior uh, uh, mode. The, 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 the place where uh, you, the highest probability uh, in, in your posterior probability. So, uh, so this is with the uh, log likelihood that is a, a combination of many observations. So if we break down the same picture by particular components of the, to, uh, of the, the log likelihood, we can see that there is this competition so this is repeating the same view, but this time we're looking at the component of the cost function that's only referring to two meter air temperature here that says, well, actually, this part of parameter space that you're favoring overall is not necessarily the best configuration for uh, getting the right temperature over land. However, it is a good uh, part of parameter space for getting short wave cloud forcing. And it's kind of in the middle of the road for getting precipitation over land. And, and it's, it's actually, uh, it could be better, but it's, uh, it's pretty good in getting the 300 millibar uh, zonal winds. There's another way of uh, kind of viewing these results. And that is to look at how the sampling evolves uh, when it's trying to match observations. And the, uh, so in this uh, sampling strategy, we use uh, something called multiple very fast simulated annealing. And that is uh, what, what it's supposed to do is to try to find stochastically regions of parameter space that best match uh, observations. And it has to do this across all these different observations simultaneously. So starting from iteration zero, we, what we see here is the fractional change in cost. Uh, so it starts out kind of in a bad part of parameter space. And, uh, and this uh, dashed blue line is for low clouds. And it's saying that the change in cost keeps on getting better and better and better for uh, low clouds. Same with shortwave radiation reaching the surface. Uh, ter temperature actually started uh, fairly negative here and then uh, kind of jumped around uh, and found something worse, but then eventually uh, got better. But one of the things to note is that while it was getting low clouds better and better, high clouds, high clouds at what net short wave radiation at the top of the atmosphere got worse and worse uh, with the number of experiments. Uh, to, uh, to the point where um, uh, uh, so the fact that in order to move forward in some observations, you have to make other ones worse is an example of this kind of this uh, struggle between the different uh, observational or for the, for the model to match simultaneously uh, these multiple uh, constraints. 
which is basically a part of the problem, and all we want really is for uh, when we search through parameter space, something that acknowledges that there is this distance so that we don't necessarily become overly confident with any particular model configuration, that the, that the posterior uh, distributions are sufficiently broad to represent uh, basically uh, some, uh, the fact that we don't know things perfectly uh, or that we shouldn't know things perfectly when there's this irreducible error between the model and the data. Okay, so in summary about irreducible errors. One is that it's a major problem for us sci scientifically uh, because it says that uh, there's something missing in our physics. Two, also from a, uh, a Bayesian model calibration, it, it gives rise to the potential for compensating uh, errors uh, unless you include a discrepancy term. But if you do that, you have to know pretty well exactly what that discrepancy is doing. And I, from a process uh, uh, perspective, if you knew what the errors were in your model and you could describe them pretty explicitly out through time, then you probably know enough to actually correct uh, the problem. So we also, I also showed that uh, in a Bayesian calibration for CAM uh, parameters where we uh, com accommodated for model discrepancy by expanding the, the uh, normalizing variance in the log likelihood that we were able to get reasonable results. That's not a proof that we will always get reasonable results, but in this case, um, it was uh, a good result. So this clearly is an area that needs further study. Okay, on to the final uh, kind of section of this lecture, and that is on the topic of emergent constraints. So emergent constraints can be used to estimate the errors in a model's predictions of climate using only error, uh, information about the errors it has in simulating present climate. So this is uh, an important uh, way of establish, establishing credibility of climate model projection information. And then and this is the logic, that if uh, you're able to see a model in the way it simulates present climate, and you would say, oh, okay, so the models that are, are furthest from observations in a certain way, that will produce a, let's say, a, a stronger response in the future or a weaker response. And we can use that, uh, that, that error information to sort of weight the different models uh, uh, because of this uh, clear uh, relationship. You know, the other perspective on this is that uh, we don't know if our model adequately explains the physics of the climate system. So we want to be able to use observations to predict climate, and we don't have observations of the future. So one of the first challenges would be, well, if you uh, want to use observations in that way, why not use the observations from another model and pretend that model is the way the physics of the climate system works? So an emergent constraint would allow you to know, predict how these different models uh, would respond to carbon uh, dioxide. And if you're able to do that, then uh, you may be in a safer footing to be able to, to claim that you can use the distance between a model and observations as a basis for saying whether your model will be more or less sensitive than, uh, the, than the real uh, climate system. So the other kind of uh, thing here is that uh, we don't yet have uh, a metric that can do this. That all the metrics that uh, uh, have not found a clear relationship uh, between errors in present and scatter in their uh, response. So you need uh, this uh, so that in the, you know, the likelihood function, you'd say the models that are closer to observations are more likely. But it could be that models that are right next to each other uh, and, and have the same, let's say, likelihood may end up being in opposite ends of a, uh, like a, uh, a less sensitive response and a more sensitive response. So that's 
the, the condition at present with our current definitions of, of a likelihood function. So what we want is to uh, maybe uh, pick or, or revise our likelihood function uh, uh, by a metric that is relevant to future climate, but it's also predictive of the scatter that would occur among these models. So really what this is about is saying that maybe we shouldn't use all observations, because when we do that, when we use all observations, we don't find this relationship. And we need this relationship in order to uh, make sense of uh, this probabilistic framework for weighting different model configurations in uh, their, uh, their response to, to global, uh, to, to carbon, to greenhouse gas uh, changes and greenhouse gas concentrations. So here are two um, uh, hy hypothesized emergent constraints, one dealing with the relative humidity in the deep tropics between the ascending and descending branch of the Hadley cell. In the ascending branch, uh, they noted that among the models that participated in the coupled model intercomparison project, the CMIP-5, I guess in this case, CMIP-3 archive, uh, that models that had a high climate sensitivity had higher relative humidity in the, in the, in the, in the um, ascending branch of the Hadley cell and drier air in the descending branch of the Hadley cell and, uh, and vice versa for low sensitivity models. And then they, they compared that to what is observed. And they noted that, well, uh, observations is basically moist in the ascending branch and uh, there wasn't much to t test from that branch. But in the descending air part of the Hadley cell, uh, that air is in observations very dry, very much like the higher sensitivity models uh, in the CMIP-5 archive. So when they did this with the CMIP-3 th uh, set of models, it had this relationship. But when they looked in the CMIP-5, uh, that relationship fell apart. In a different uh, emergent constraint, this is by Sherwood, uh, published by Sherwood and, and, and colleagues in 2014. They looked at an index called, I think, the Lower tr uh, Troposphere Mixing Index, LTMI, and uh, which uh, basically has something to do with the processes that control the amount of mixing from the boundary layer into the free troposphere. Uh, and this, is, uh, this index is largely focuses uh, in, the, in the tropical regions, but not exclusively. And, and they noticed that when this index is less, that the CMIP archive had uh, favored models that were, had a low climate sensitivity and that as you increase this index that uh, there were stronger uh, cloud feedbacks that gave that model um, a, a higher, a larger response to greenhouse gas forcing. So uh, let's say this one, uh, I mean there is some sort of emergent constraint uh, that is apparent here. Uh, there still is a lot of scatter and uh, so may maybe that's the, a part of the answer. So we looked uh, within our single model ensemble whether we could break these emergent constraints. And that is to look for alternate model configurations that could have been selected, let's say in the case of the uh, NCAR community atmosphere model, that could have been uh, uh, created that uh, let's say may fit on this emergent constraint at present, but it may, that may have been by chance. And we could uh, select an alternate model configuration that would draw that model away uh, from, from that line and therefore we would uh, uh, break it. And then we would uh, use, oh, okay. Uh, Uh, okay, so that, that's one thing we're doing, uh, and then this, this other way of, of, of looking at it, which is, which is uh, what's here on the, on the slide, uh, I should have looked uh, first, is uh, to create, uh, using regression modeling in model selection, which are kind of s statistical terms for this exercise of finding out what's important to that model's predictions. 
and you can um, uh, uh, okay. So we, we use the same ensemble that uh, I explained earlier, and, and so we, all I have to say is it's basically Bayesian calibration of a set of 15 uh, parameters, and we use a, a, the community atmosphere model that's, that has been coupled to a slab ocean. We use 12 different types of observational constraints, and we come up with uh, a range of parameter settings that allow the model to approximate observations. And it, in, in, in this ensemble of, um, uh, we got um, 1,800 different model configurations that were acceptable. We took every 10th one to, uh, to do global warming experiments. And when we do that global warming experiments, we get a range of climate sensitivity between two degrees and four degrees. So that's the range in the amount of warming that would occur after we double CO2. And this is the effect of the uncertain parameters on the strength of that uh, warming. So then we, we ask the question, well, what is it about this model, the errors that existed in the, in the, or the differences among the models that existed for present climate that would be predictive of, of this uh, range of climate sensitivity? And we did it uh, very carefully. Uh, trying to find uh, model uh, structures that were robust, that uh, there's some probability that you can do this uh, uh, by, by chance, but uh, uh, in this paper that is in preparation, uh, we can create this regression model and know that the predictors are robust. And the uh, so it did an excellent job of basically saying, uh, given uh, the errors that exist for a present climate, it can predict uh, what happened. And if it falls along that line, it means you did a, a good job. And we withheld a number of samples. And uh, those two we were able to predict. So these predictor maps are interesting looking in that uh, it uh, this is the predictor map for two meter air temperature. So the way to read this is that uh, the dark blue or purple shows that those models had cooler temperatures in the polar regions and that those that was uh, basically negatively correlated with the anomalies that occurred with, with the doubling CO2, let's say. So the negative here refers to th that there would be extra warming in high latitudes you can think that there's a sea ice albedo feedback mechanism operating such that in, in a cool modern climate, uh, or let's say a model configuration that produces more sea ice, uh, may also be a model configuration that has larger uh, albedo feedbacks at high latitudes after you double CO2, adding to the warmth of that uh, simulation. But that's at polar regions, but if you see there's Basically, uh, these predictors show structures uh, in the mid-latitudes, in the tropics, that are, at this point for me, hard to interpret as easily as, let's say, the sea ice one. But it's interesting as a diagnostic uh, to know where in the model errors are mattering, matter to uh, predictions. This is for two meter air temperature and a much more complicated map for total precipitation. Uh, even harder for me to, to, to explain every one of these uh, features and why a certain one would be positively or negatively uh, correlated with, with climate uh, sensitivity. So one of the questions about emergent constraints is whether uh, we, we can learn enough about a single model to predict what happens in other models. So here we're going to use these predictor maps that do an excellent job of predicting the CAM models climate sensitivity, and we're going to apply that to uh, the CMIP5 archive to predict the other models. And the result is on the next slide. So uh, it was a spectacular failure. And what does a spectacular failure look like? So this is, on the x-axis, the observed, uh, what well, we know each model configuration for, from the CMIP-5 archive, uh, what the, its climate sensitivity is. And this is what the Bayesian 
uh, predictions were for the climate sensitivity using these predictor maps. And, and I would say uh, there's no uh, good <laughs> relationship between those uh, predictors and, and, uh, and the actual climate sensitivity. And um, so what is that? Yeah, how do we interpret that? So uh, from the way we did our analysis, at least in the, in, in the, using the, 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 the tools that we had, that we were able to exploit a lot of information about the CAM, a lot of its structures in constructing its predictors. But those were really, in some sense, uh, trained on the CAM model. And the CAM model is not precisely the, the, the same as what happens in other models. And so um, it, it just means that, that we can't directly use these predictors in the way that we wanted to to predict the CMIP-5 archives. Uh, and that the structures in CAM3 uh, may be relevant, but are not directly, let's say, easily uh, applied to the CMIP-5 archive. So there, I'll end uh, my presentation. And of course, since I'm doing this talk after uh, basically the whole workshop has ended, uh, I have no questions. And uh, sorry about not hitting record on, my, uh, on the camera when uh, I was speaking earlier this week. So thank you.